Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today uh, on this really important uh, occasion. We're, we're very fortunate to be uh, launching a new report called Defining Islamophobia, a contemporary understanding of how expressions of Muslimness are targeted. This is a, a new report by the Muslim Council of Britain, expanding on how Islamophobia has been defined by the APPG on British Muslims. And it establishes a framework of reference that helps determine what does and what does not constitute Islamophobia. And what we try and do in this report is address key concerns and objections that have been leveled against the definition. And importantly, look at how we can operationalize this preeminent definition so we can tackle Islamophobia across the country. But really, this is really fantastic to see so many people join us today um, uh, on this evening uh, and not get too worked up about being on Zoom the whole day and also in the evening. Um, we have a, a really fantastic panel today um, uh, with esteemed guests, starting with uh, Baroness Saidawarsi, uh, who will be in, uh, in the first panel with uh, Councillor Fadima Fuduma Hassan Robert, and Robert Sharp. Uh, and that will be the first panel which, uh, with those three individuals. And the second panel is with Riz Rizwana Hamid, Dr. Zain Sardar and Mariam Daras, and um, Aisha Chowdhury. Uh, but before we start, really, this today is all about sharing some of these really important insights from these important people who have great insights on the, this definition. And we will be talking about why this definition is so important, why we need a definition to move forward. But before we start that, I'd like to really introduce, and it's my great pleasure to introduce, our new Secretary General, Zara Muhammad, who will give an opening address. Um, Zara, as many of you will know, she's uh, uh, the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain uh, as the largest umbrella body of Muslim organizations in the country. Zara is the first, first woman uh, Secretary General and she has started her post only a few weeks ago, um, right in the deep end right now and enjoying her time. So looking forward to, to hearing her opening address. Zara. Thank you, Mikdad. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone, and Bismillah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, it's wonderful to join you this evening. Um, and as Mikdad rightly pointed out, it's been quite a whirlwind. And in the spirit of this report, I guess it's only fitting to share some of my own reflections on why this topic is so important and why it's been such um, an important cause to me in making sure that tackling Islamophobia is at the top of the agenda. Only within a week of my election, I was already faced with so much scrutiny about what it really meant for a Muslim woman to be in charge of such a large organization. Were the men really going to let her lead? And um, what about all of the stereotypes? And I think a lot of people really struggled to process um, what my election meant. And I guess this idea of who Muslims really are, um, aside from the, the preconceptions and the stereotypes that um, many put on us. So I think, um, you know, defining Islamophobia and appreciating its impact on everyday life um, is really at the heart of what we are talking about and what this report is talking about. Today, unfortunately, we still have people that even challenge the idea that Islamophobia exists. Um, they, they don't take to the fact that this is a cause, this is an issue that we face every single day, and not just overtly, physical and abusive, but also systemically. And that is where the, the deepest challenge and the most sinister part of this um, is really worth all of our attention in combating. And I think here today, you know, this report brings together, and as well as this panel today, so many esteemed contributors, guests, and people who have both the lived experience as well as the academic background on the picture and how broad and deep it is. So I hope really in this evening's discussion, as well as um, the launch of the actual report, you will get an insight into the broader reality as well as get the toolkits as to how we can work together. Because I really believe that Islamophobia is not just a Muslim issue. It is one that affects all of society. And until we get rid of these divisive um, and very uh, hate-driven um, ideals, and we won't be able to push forward. And so really this is about an invitation to everybody here to create a partnership, to work together and to take these conversations beyond those of us who already agree, but to actually um, wider society that we need their support. We need them, them to call out this behavior um, as much as we also need to do it. 
but but let's be tactical um, and let's inshallah make a change that will really impact all of our communities so thank you so much and um, it's lovely to to join you all and i really do look forward in to the the leadership journey that awaits me and um, i've just completed a month so i'm feeling like i've already done a year um, but yeah, and I'm looking forward to working with all of you as well in the, in the future of MCB. Thank you so much, McDad. Thank you so much, Zara. And it's a real pleasure to have Zara um, open the, the, the session today. Um, as the new Secretary General, this new report will be under her. And we will see uh, over the next few, few months and years ahead how this definition makes uh, an even greater impact. So we'd like to now move on to uh, a short a short poem which uh, by Suhaima Manzur Khan, uh, which will now be shown on the screen. The sound isn't coming through at the moment, so. The clothes that we dress in, the languages we speak, the areas. Of course, Muslims belong to every. Of course, Muslims belong to every culture, ethnicity, nationality, and none, because Muslim simply means the one who practices Islam. But today, because Muslims are assumed to be identifiable by the food that we eat, the clothes that we dress in, the languages we speak, the areas we live in, or the color of our skin, this collection of identity markers are made to be the sign that we are Muslim. So then that Muslimness is made into the sign that we are villains, marking us as violent, uncivilized enemies within. And this meaning making of those markers is the process of racialization. Because race is just a story told about a collection of characteristics historically used to justify inequalities in global politics. This means race and racism always have specific histories and contexts. But right now, it means declaring Islamophobia as racism is an urgent project because that racism is evident in every facet of the system because when doctors and teachers are legally required to keep an eye out for those of us they feel are in suspicious attire or when employers and landlords reject and refuse those of us whose names aren't easily found in who's who or when muslims are disproportionately stopped at the border or have our citizenship stripped in the name of maintaining law and order or if the places muslims pray in are attacked and vandalized it becomes preposterous to deny that Muslims have been racialized. Racism is the only way these correlations can be analyzed. To be or appear to be Muslim in the ways you look or behave increases your experiences of harm at the hands of institutions every day. Almost 50% of Muslims live in poverty in the UK. Newspapers and politicians have normalized targeting us as okay. At school, at hospital, the border, the train, in prison and within legislation, being or appearing to be Muslim means you are going to experience racism. So we have to move away from thinking of only hate crimes and individual acts of sadism. From today, we must acknowledge Islamophobia as a form of structural racism. This doesn't limit theological debate or what questions can be asked of Islam, Recognizing Islamophobia as racism is simply the only way we can even begin to address its harm. Thank you very much for that video. And it's always great to see Suhaima uh, and, and her spoken word uh, always getting the powerful message across very clearly. As you can see, Islamophobia is a type of racism. It's rooted in racism and it's a type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. And that's the definition that we're talking about today. And without further ado, I'd really, um, I'd like to move on to our panel today. And um, um, we're very fortunate to have a, a, a great panel. I mean, uh, very fortunate to have these types of uh, people who are willing to come and speak to us, starting off with Baroness Warsi, um, and then Councillor Aduma Hassan and Robert, Sh Ro Robert Sharp afterwards. Um, let's start with uh, Baroness, the Right Honourable, Baroness Seda Warsi. Um, You'll, you many, all of you will be aware of who she is. She, she was the uh, treasurer of the APPG on British Muslims. She's a former solicitor of the Crown Prosecution, Prosecution Service, a politician and a member of the House of Lords who served as the co-chairwoman of the uh, Conservative Party from 2010 to 2012. 
She's also served as the Minister of State for the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office and as the Minister of State for Faith and Communities. But probably most famously, as we can say about right now, she's dipped her toe into a bit of comedy in, in a stand-up to cancer special with Nick Helm, uh, uh, the, the first of which uh, was on Channel 4 at 9 p.m. last Thursday. Hopefully many of you saw that, and we'll find out more this Thursday. But without further ado, let's see, uh, uh, let's uh, welcome um, uh, Baroness Warsi to, to speak on this really important topic. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mikdad, although some people would say that having been a politician and a lawyer, I've been training to be a joker most of my life. Uh, so therefore, maybe what I'm doing now is not that new after all. Um, can I start really? Good evening, Aslam Alaikum. Can I start by uh, paying my own congratulations now publicly uh, to Zara? We have, of course, uh, spoken. I think her appointment as uh, and her election as the uh, Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain is historic. It is is a, a huge moment, uh, not just because she's a woman, but because of her age. Uh, it is, uh, in the famous words of uh, David Cameron and Tony Blair, uh, we were the future ones, and now it's you, Zara. It's, uh, we're handing over the baton, and it gives me great hope uh, that it is being handed over to young people like yourself, who have the courage and the tenacity and the vision and the commitment uh, to keep fighting these battles for equality which is what we're talking about today, the battle for equality. Fundamentally, that is what Islamophobia is. It's a form of races, racism, another, the latest form of racism. Uh, and it is another battle that those of us who spent most of our timing, most of our time fighting racism based upon the color of our skin uh, in our much younger days, uh, have already fought and hadn't won. And then now we're facing another form of racism. For somebody like me, who's now uh, 50 in a couple of weeks time, it seems to have been the battle of uh, our, the whole of our lives. Uh, but I think today should really be an optimistic meeting uh, because I think sometimes we can focus on what we haven't achieved rather than on what has been achieved. And I want to take a few moments today really to focus on what has been achieved. About 10 years ago, Almost uh, to the month, um, I did my first keynote speech in government and uh, and having just having been um, uh, appointed as the as Britain's first Muslim cabinet minister, I didn't shy away from saying, well, it is important to talk about the community that I know and understand well. And what I was acutely aware of uh, at that time was that the debate and discussion in relation to Islamophobia was certainly not taking place in the mainstream. And so the keynote speech that I gave at the time, which some of you may recall, was that Islamophobia had passed the dinner table test. And what I meant by that was that this new form of racism, which I now define as Britain's brigatory blind spot, uh, was being found in the most respectable of settings. It was being found in newsrooms. It was being found in think tanks. It was being found, dare I say, in political parties and that it needed to be tackled uh, by understanding it as a form of racism. Uh, and when I first did that speech, I think the reaction that I got back was, well, it really doesn't exist. And if it does exist, where is the data? And so certainly the first couple of years were spent simply trying to create the structures in which we could start to capture the data. And although that data was predominantly in the form of hate crime and online abusive incidents, it started to capture the fact that this was real and this was happening. We also saw much of this during the Leveson inquiry, where we were told quite clearly that editors were asking their journalists to go out and find stories which were negative about Muslims. And uh, uh, there's been a plethora of work done about looking at when Muslims are talked about and the way in which they are lumped together through a set of characteristics targeting their Muslimness, and it is a form of racism. And, but uh, when we got to that point where it was obvious that the data existed, we started to create structures within government uh, to try and understand this issue. When we created the cross-government working group on anti-Muslim hatred, it was actually quite shocking that this didn't already exist. The structures for dealing with anti-Semitism, which I think is very similar, already existed within government, and yet we chose not to go down that route and s set up similar structures in order to... 
most, we set up the cross-government working group on uh, anti-Muslim hatred. We started to look at ways in which obvious extreme examples of Islamophobia during our lifetime should be remembered and commemorated. And that, and, and out of that came the Remembering Srebrenica program, which is a phenomenal program which still continues to exist. And also to push back in relation to the spaces in which Muslims occupy their daily lives. So lots of work around uh, the big iftar, uh, Sadaqa day. And I think these were kind of um, nuanced uh, programs which government started to put in place alongside the hard work of making sure that police forces disaggregated their uh, data on hate crime and to make sure that Islamophobia and racism directed towards uh, people as Muslimness was being recorded and captured. But all along, the government uh, continued to argue uh, that uh, we didn't need a definition. Um, and uh, having tried uh, to try and deal with this within government and having been unsuccessful, uh, we started to deal with this through the parliamentary process. So the all party parliamentary group on British Muslims uh, went about the task of going across the country and seeking um, uh, evidence from uh, victims, from academics, from community organizations, uh, we had open town hall style meetings, we had great discussions about what the word should be, uh, whether it should be anti-Muslim racism, whether it should be Islamophobia, and overwhelmingly, although many people argued that Islamophobia was not the most perfect of terms, as, as I think people would argue in relation to, say, homophobia or anti-Semitism, that these are not the most perfect of words, it was the one in which the community felt most represented their experiences. So that was the word upon which we landed. And then uh, it was obvious from all the evidence that we heard and from specific cases where people who were not Muslim, the um, young Italian man who was attacked in London because he was perceived to be Muslim because of the colour of his hair and the colour of his skin, uh, the Sikh man who was attacked because he was perceived to be Muslim because of the because of his turban, it was clear that Muslimness, uh, the identity of uh, being Muslim or being perceived as Muslim, had absolutely nothing to do with theology or practice. And that really this was a form of racism which was completely disconnected to Islam as a religion, but actually it was a prejudice based upon tropes that were being systematically imposed upon a community. Um, and so we came up with this definition that Islam, uh, that uh, Islamophobia is uh, rooted in racism and is a form of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. We felt it was short and snappy and it kind of went to the heart of what this was about. And then we had lots of additional kind of explanatory notes of the kind of things that that would include. And, um, and thankfully, what I found when we got to the end of that process um, was that the, um, the amount of support that we got for it, first and foremost, within Britain's Muslim communities. Look, this is a definition which seeks to protect predominantly Britain's Muslim communities, as well as others who may be perceived to be Muslim. And therefore, it had to be a definition which was acceptable to uh, large members of the Muslim community. We had to own it. It had to be our definition. And it was fantastic to see organizations and individuals and institutions, over 800 of them now and still counting, from British Muslims for Secular Democracy through to uh, the Muslim Women's Network, through to uh, the Muslim Council of Britain and various others, who in the past may have had disagreements on, on many issues, suddenly found themselves on the same platform saying this is a form of racism. It also had the support of academia, who were experts in this area. Over 80 academics who were experts in this area supported it. It had the support of parliamentarians across the political divide. It was signed up to by every political party, including the Conservative Party in Scotland, but was not signed by the Conservative Party in England and Wales, and therefore was not adopted by the government. What did come of this though, however, was that the government finally acknowledged the need to have a definition for Islamophobia, just not the one that the Muslims wanted. Um, so although we had made some progress in accepting the fact that Islamophobia was an issue, that it was documented, that there was evidence to support the fact that this was real, the fact that actually it needed to be defined for us to resolve, for us to start to resolve this issue, uh, we then got stuck at this moment of saying that we needed government decided that they wanted to define it 
And to start that process, they appointed, they said that they would appoint two experts who would then conduct their own work. Um, one, they have to date only appointed one expert, um, who is Kari Asim, who himself is supportive of the definition. No second expert has been appointed, no terms of reference have been set, and no further work has been done. Um, and so in many ways, I think this is all against the backdrop of, and it gives me com no comfort to say this, this is all against the backdrop of a party in government, which it itself finds itself mired uh, in accusations of racism and institutional Islamophobia and racism, and which itself has failed to deal with this issue internally, and which currently is going through a long overdue report uh, on the issue of racism. So I think that's the kind of political stage that we're in. The hope I take from that is that even over the last decade, that I think there is now a real understanding of what Islamophobia is, an acknowledgement of the fact that it has to be defined, the fact that including many in the devolved government, every single party in Scotland, for example, um, and Wales has adopted the definition, the NUS uh, has uh, adopted the definition, um, and it is it is now starting, and, and I think uh, uh, councils up and down the country have adopted the definition, a university has adopted the definition, but the work now starts for that definition to be um, embedded into institutions. Many people keep arguing with me and saying we really have to keep working with government to take on this definition for it to have real impact. My argument is you, we just need to get on with it and apply our definition and government can just get with the program eventually. And so what I would argue is that we need to make sure that this definition is adopted as widely as possible. Yes, of course, that um, uh, of course, um, there are going to be individuals and even individual organizations within the Muslim communities who are not entirely happy with the definition. I mean, we've had a bit of an issue where FOSIS adopted the definition, and now I think the latest leadership within FOSIS are probably considering not adopting the definition. We, I don't think we should get ourselves embroiled in that. This is the widest possible. Poss uh, well, this is the widest adopted definition. It is the one that has had the most uh, uh, widest consultation. It has the support of parliamentarians. It has the support of, I think, almost every Muslim uh, British uh, M British Muslim parliamentarian in uh, either the devolved powers or in Westminster Bar. I think Khalid Mahmood. So that probably says it all for you. Um, and. And so I think in many ways, I, I think we can now, uh, my view is that we need to stop, we can either spend the next 10 years arguing about the, um, the success that we've had to date, or we can get on with embedding the success that we've had to date. And I think therefore my, my kind of um, urge and plea to you all today is discuss the de definition, discuss what it means, uh, but then beyond that, you know, we're not a debating society. Uh, we are actually a community that requires protection. So let's get on with having this adopted so that the future generations uh, of which uh, Zara is going to have the privilege of being of uh, leading uh, have the protection that many of mine did not. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Brana Swarovski. And uh, I know that you weren't able to stay for too long with it, as we as we discussed earlier. But thank you so much for your for your for your contribution. It's a, a really important time, and you know, with the APG on British Muslims, which you are uh, a, a core part of, uh, played a really important role in in putting that definite. Um, bringing communities together to, from all different walks of life. You know, to to, to get to that definition, and you know the Muslim communities across the country are obviously will be very thankful that we've been able to get that done. So thank you, Baroness Rossi, for your role in that. I'm going to stay for a little while uh, until I can, and then I'll, I, I'll just quietly kind of uh, leave. So thank, thank you for having me. No, thank you for joining today. Um, and and we're, we're now very fortunate to have uh, Councillor Faduma Hassan, um, who is an activist and a Labour councillor representing Kil the Kilburn Ward in London. She's spoken and written extensively on the topic of women, Islamophobia and barriers into politics. And today she's going to be speaking on this very topic and uh, talking about the experiences of Islamophobia in the political sphere as a visibly Muslim woman politician. So Faduma. Thank you very much. And assalamu alaikum, everyone. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, I. Firstly, thank you very much, MCB, for inviting me and many congratulations to Zara on your leadership. 
And I really want to start off by echoing uh, the last point that Baroness Warsi said on uh, adopting the definition and how important that is. My own council in Brent in London has adopted it, but I think one of the things that I want to sort of uh, talk on is the adoption itself self is one thing but we also need to ensure that the examples and the tropes that comes with islamophobia are also addressed and people are aware of those as well um, and i think we could all we would have all seen the you know the interview that zara had with women's hour and actually some of those tensions that come that, that might not be necessarily like you know somebody coming after her or um, you know, or perhaps being threatened physically, et cetera. But those sort of aggressions and so on are there, I think, in public life and are so normal these days. And that's one of the things that I want to address. So I think the first thing that I've experienced, I've been asked to speak about my experiences as a counsellor and, and around Islamophobia. I think my first one would be around the assumptions that are made as uh, about me as a Muslim woman. So the assumptions are varied, including about my abilities and my intellect and who's controlling me in essence. So the idea being that as a Muslim woman, that I wouldn't necessarily be able to speak for myself, have my own political mind and opinions and so on. But there are these gang of uh, mostly Muslim men that are sort of telling me what to do. So I've had experiences where I've been asked, like, you know, does my father know about my views? Does he approve of those things? And you might think that these things are not necessarily, you know, they not, might not be the biggest thing, but actually what it ends up doing is dehumanizing me and taking away my abilities and my, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And the other thing I think that is worth noting is about the political participation. So Muslims, and in my experience, there are a level of over scrutiny, if you like, in terms of my participation in political life. So questions that I would get that my other co-counselors that are not Muslim wouldn't necessarily get. So that could vary uh, from, I've been asked about my views on abortion, on uh, gay rights and so on. Um, I've been asked questions that are, have nothing to do with my work in council life, but are seen to be completely normal to ask just because I happen to be a Muslim uh, counselor. And I think that kind of question also uh, goes over to what are deemed to be Muslim issues. So people won't necessarily ask me or over sort of analyze my views on housing matters or what I think should happen on, uh, you know, on like bin collections, et cetera, which what are the things councillors deal with, but actually what my views are on Saudi Arabia. And if I criticize China, why am I not looking at Saudi in, in that much more detail? So I think it's also the lifestyle choices and so on that we need to be aware of when we talk about this topic. Um, and the homogenization of what my view should be. And, you know, if there is one Muslim uh, counselor that has X view, then, then my view must be very similar to that, of course, because, you know, why not? We're all Muslim, right? And I think all these things, I think what I just want to say is all these things are to me really important. It's not necessarily just about the, you know, street harassment that I have, I have received or the threats or being followed or et cetera, or, you know, questioning of your hijab and all of that kind of thing. I think all of those things, of course, play in and of course are very real. We've seen, you know, the numbers speak for themselves and I'm sure others will cover that. But I think these kind of microaggressions or whatever you want to call them, I don't, I think the thing I would say is I don't want them to be deemed to be harmless because I do think that they do play a role in the increases of Islamophobia and how it is perceived to be normalized in our society. So I think I will leave it there. I don't want it to be taken as it being subtle and sort of overlooked. And I hope we can have further discussions in the Q&A on those things, but just to share some of my experiences on that. Mehdad. Thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. And you know, uh, it I'm actually, you know, when you look at politicians out there, you look at young ones like Faduma and you look at um, uh, ones with great experience like Baron Aswarsi and you see the, the talent that's in our community and it's, alhamdulillah, really great to see. So thank you, Faduma, and thank you, uh, Baron Aswarsi, earlier uh, for speaking uh, on this really important topic. Um, 
we're now uh, very fortunate to have Robert Sharp, um, who will be speaking. Um, he is uh, a freedom ex of expression activist and author. And from 2009 to 2018, he was head of campaigns for the English Center of Penn International, which uh, promotes literature and freedom of expression across frontiers. Many of you will be aware that some people thought, think that defining Islamophobia it, it's a problem when it comes to free speech rather than actually being the opposite. And, and Robert is going to share his view on how he thinks that this definition does not contravene free speech, but actually does the opposite. So Robert. Thank you, thank you. Um, at first, it's an honor to be on a, a panel with uh, Baroness Varsi. She's been uh, such a crucial voice in parliament uh, in the past, uh, past decade or so. Um, and also congratulations, uh, Zara, on, on your appointment. Um, and also congratulations to you, Mikdad, and to, uh, and to Tabitha uh, Batty, who have put together this report. Um, working with you, I've learned a lot about the, the nuance of Islam that as a non-Muslim I didn't really understand. Um, and my article that's in the report um, is grounded in my experience at English Pen. Um, so I was head of campaigns for 10 years. Uh, and I spent that time campaigning for writers all, all around the world and in the UK uh, who'd been prosecuted or persecuted because of what they'd written or, or, or what they'd said. To the extent that it matters, um, many of those campaigns were for Muslims, um, some of whom were minorities in the country where they were imprisoned, um, such as the, the Uyghurs in China, uh, for example. Um, and in other cases, the, the prosecution, the, the censorship was by the government of a Muslim majority country. Um, and including perhaps the most abhorrent case I ever worked on has been in the news this week, which is the, the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi in 2018. Um, and we heard that the assassination was, was approved by the Crown Prince of, of Saudi Arabia, um, a, an example of the most extreme censorship coming from the very top. Of society. But one thing I learned from my time at Penn is that, that no creed has a, has a monopoly on censorship. None is, is particularly worse than another. So I also campaigned against censorship in Christian countries, Hindu countries, the, the Jewish country, Buddhist countries, and, and atheist states as well. Um, and I, I noticed that if faith was ever used as a reason to censor, and it, it often was, then it was almost always part of a wider power play. It, it was never purely theological. Um, and so that's an interesting dynamic, but one for another day, I, I, I think. Um, another interesting theme I, I spend a lot of time talking about, which I'll, I'll touch on briefly, is the fact that free speech is not only about the right to be controversial. controversial. Um, so being offensive is an important pillar uh, of free speech uh, that, that I'll defend to the end of my days, um, in, including the right to be blasphemous and to insult what other people hold sacred because of the relationship between the sacred and who holds power. But there's a second pillar of free speech, which is the importance of diversity, of giving everyone in society a, a platform to speak. And too often the sort of libertarian defenders of free speech, they, they forget about diversity. They're only interested in the right to offend, um, and which I, I say in my, my article in the report, it, that's a very hollow conception of free speech. So the first thing I'll say about this report, which I have had sight of, um, an embargoed version, uh, and the APPG report that preceded it, um, and indeed this new definition of, of Islamophobia, is that it gives a voice to people who our society, British society, doesn't usually hear from. So in that sense, it's an exercise in free speech in itself. Uh, the piece I wrote starts on page uh, uh, 76. <laughs> uh, it's, it's short and it, it stands for itself. Uh, but I want to expand briefly on, on the central point, which is about the, the, the chilling effect. And when lawyers and activists talk about a chill on something, they, they mean something very specific. It's not just about censorship in general. 
a chill is when you discourage or prevent something that is is legal that should be legal uh, and that parliament and society uh, intends to be legal intends to be permitted uh, so we're, we're when we talk about chill we're in the realm of, of self-censorship uh, we're in the realm of the police investigations into speech that, that don't end in a charge we're in the realm of people claiming something's not allowed when in, in fact it is. And, and as I say in the article, uh, the chill happens when a law or a definition uh, is vague or it's broad or, or it's ambiguous. Um, before I go further, we, we need to be clear, a, a, a pejorative word like Islamophobia, just like racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, uh, it does have the potential to chill, uh, to chill speech. And in fact, that's sort of the point of these words. It, it is to condemn and to, to discourage and to bring about social uh, opprobrium uh, and, and to bring consequences. Um, and I'll return to the, that point about consequences, the sort of consequences um, in a moment. But the reason why I think that this revised definition of Islamophobia is to be welcomed is because it narrows the definition from what went before. It makes things less ambiguous. So I don't want to say that this definition is going to eradicate a chill on free speech, but compared to what went, went, went before, it, it does expand the space for, for freedom of expression. And my challenge to those, it seems a lot of them are in the Conservative Party, um, who worry about this definition um, on free speech grounds, is, is to tell me whether there's anything that you could say now, or you could say before, when Islamophobia was a more nebulous concept, is, is there anything you could say before that you feel would be chilled by this new definition? And I can't think of anything that fits that category. And instead, I can, I can only think of things that other people might have called Islamophobic in the past that, that clearly aren't included in this new narrow definition that's, that's grounded in, in racism. So by this definition, speaking out against female genital mutilation, for example, is, is not Islamophobic, although in the past people have suggested that it, that it might be. By this definition, speaking out against Sharia or other religious courts it is not in itself Islamophobic. By this definition, the, the, the Jesus and Muhammad cartoon strip um, it is not Islamophobic, and, and nor in itself is, is any depiction of the prophet, even if it's controversial and offensive to many people. Uh, and, and two literary examples, um, by this definition, the satanic verses was not Islamophobic, even though it might have been offensive. Uh, and by this definition, the jewel of Medina by Sherry Jones was not Islamophobic. Uh, although it might have been guilty of Orientalism or what we today call cultural appropriation. Um, but those are, those are different pejoratives and they could do with being better defined as, as well. Um, and section two of the, of the report actually has, has more examples along, along that lines. Now, a lot of those examples I mentioned are actually wedge issues that are designed to rile up non-Muslims and free speech campaigners. Uh, and so I think narrowing the definition robs the extremists on, on both sides um, who, who have an interest in keeping us divided. Um, it must be really tiresome for campaigners such as you all to have to constantly affirm what I just affirmed, that certain things aren't Islamophobic. Um, but I'm afraid that's part of the work um, and it has to come from groups like the MCB because for a white cultural Christian like me who's a sort of self-styled free speech activist I'm sorry it's just not persuasive for me to claim that this book or that that discussion is outside the definition um, but when the same assertions are made by 
the general secretary of, of the Muslim council uh, or by prominent Muslims in the House of Lords, they, they, they carry far more weight. And so, as I say, it's tiresome, but, but you sort of have to do it because being vocal about what Islamophobia isn't does go hand in hand with the main project, which is explaining uh, what it is. Um, I, I don't want to claim that there's no ambiguities in the kind of examples I, I've, I've given. It, it, it is possible to write an Islamic, Islamophobic book, and it's, it's certainly possible to draw cartoons of Muhammad that are designed to, uh, to intimidate or to harass uh, or to imply that all Muslims are terrorists or whatever. But that would be Islamophobic not because they depict Muhammad, but because they seek to imply something negative uh, as a universal trait about, about all Muslims. And likewise, I can also imagine sort of very simp simplistic discussions of history or theology, um, which within its context can actually be, be construed as, as Islamophobic and, and racist because it carries that implication about the people as a whole. Um, and the, the most obvious example of this is discussion, sort of perennial discussion about the prophet's wives. Um, and on the face of it, it that, that's about history. And in some context, uh, I mean, it, it could be about feminism or, or the protection of young women. But in another context, and especially when that context is 200 characters on Twitter or, or on the pages of a tabloid newspaper, it's really an attempt to just link all axes, uh, all of Islam to, to, to sexism and, and to abuse. And if that's the case, then I, we shouldn't be shy. Uh, we shouldn't be worried about, about contextualizing such speech, speeching and, and, and calling it Islamophobic. Um, and I actually think refusal to admit any context is, is to limit thoughts and, and to insist on simplicity is, is certainly anti-intellectual. And I think it might also be anti-freedom of expression as, as well. Um, but at some point, some ambiguity does remain and it, it's only with context um, that we can sort the genuine discussion from I Islamophobia. But I repeat, it all becomes narrower with, with uh, uh, um, it, it becomes easier with a, a narrower um, definition. Um, I know I'm running out of time now, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. But earlier I mentioned consequences. Um, just because we brand something as Islamophobic, it does not necessarily mean that it should be banned. And to call something Islamophobic is a value judgment. It's, it's uh, a, um, the appropriate consequence to calling something Islamophobic is, is a social punishment. Uh, it's, it's right that people think less of you when you say something racist. The criminal law at the moment doesn't sanction racism or Islamophobia or anti-Semitism just in itself. It, it, it does actually require something more, um, a, a stirring up of hatred or, or a kind of direct attack that we would, we would call a, a, a threat. Um, so, it, being Islamophobic might already be a crime, but it requires it requires something else. Um, but again, narrowing the definition uh, expands the space for for that kind of free speech that that borders on the criminal law, as well. And the real problem, or the, the interesting space for me, is is below the level of the criminal law. Um, so, should being racist or transphobic or Islamophobic, should any of those things in, uh, affect your employment? Um, it is difficult to see how it couldn't, but this is where I and other free speech activists start to worry about whether the sanctions for certain kinds of odious speech are appropriate. Um, and I think we're seeing employment tribunals become uh, the free speech front line in this regard. Um, and I do think that um, everyone should uphold free speech rights, abide by a wider free speech spirit, um, even if they're not legally required to defend uh, free speech rights. Um, it doesn't mean keeping quiet. We use our own free speech to, to call out Islamophobia and racism um, when we perceive it. 
um, but it does mean showing some restraint when it comes to, to that formal uh, punishment. Um, and I, I prefer the social condemnation um, or reporting someone to social media rather than trying to get someone prosecuted or to get someone sacked. Not everyone on this Zoom call will agree with me on that, but I, I think that's where the most fruitful and enlightening disagreements will lie. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Robert. And, you know, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to have you on the panel and, you know, share your insights as someone with, with that expertise within free speech, which has been a, a, a place where some of the critic, critiques of, of the definition have, have, have cited as their, as their main reason. And, and it's great to hear that, that multiplicity of views and most importantly, the value of context and nuance and the fact that in reality, a lot is often can be Islamophobic in some contexts, but wouldn't be in other contexts. And, and bringing that out very important is very important as part of this, this discussion. And, and to be honest, re relevant to all forms of, and all types of racism. Um, I'd like to uh, now bring in uh, other members of the panel who uh, are still here. So Faduma, if you're still here, um, and, and, and Robert, uh, it would be great to hear some, some of you, uh, your views on some of the questions that have come, come through. So let me, let's start with one of the questions on intersectionality. Um, can intersectionality be addressed in the definition? Um, for example, the racism experienced by Muslim women may be different from the experiences of Muslim men, and Arab Muslims can be different from Pakistani Muslims and so on. These differences within groups and between individuals also need to be acknowledged within the definition and understood. What do you think about that, Faduma? Yeah, uh, I mean, I completely agree with the assumptions that are sort of being made within that question. Um, I think a lot of, I think sexism, misogyny, uh, anti-black racism, that sort of, all of that kind of thing definitely feed into Islamophobia. A lot of the times, uh, you know, when my Muslimness is questioned, uh, it's always on the backdrop of, oh, there are these Muslims and you sort of fit there, but you don't, but they're South Asian, so we don't quite understand you. So I think that's always, that context is also always there. So it's definitely something that I think needs to be explored. And obviously being a visibly Muslim woman um, and that gendered Islamophobia is, is a, a whole category in itself that, that that needs is sort of its own space to explore. Thank you very much. One of the questions that seems to come up quite a lot is this idea of Islamophobia being rooted in racism and being a type of racism. There have been a number of different questions like that. Um, some, some asking specifically uh, about um, Islamophobia being a type of racism. Does that, does that really work when there are multiple ethnicities, uh, Muslims of, of different ethnicities? Um, uh, maybe Faduma and then Robert, get, get your thoughts in as well. I think it does work to an extent. I mean, are most of the time black Muslims are, what you know, within these discussions, we're not necessarily there. It's always with, with the backdrop of being South Asian, et cetera. So I think there is an element of racialization. It, it isn't, you know, when we talk about other perceived sort of Muslims, we're talking about, generally, we talk about other brown people. We're not talking about uh, black Muslims, et cetera. So it, I understand where, there are levels of tensions that I think we do have to address, um, but overall in the wider picture it is a definition I think that works. Robert? Yeah, on the point about intersectionality, um, the most of the free speech campaigns for individuals that I've worked on have been minorities within minorities. Um, so it's, it, it, yeah, it's it's incredibly important, and and a definition like this uh, really helps those people uh, and brings a bit of uh, diversity to to within in the faith, um, I guess. Um, and just my my personal experience again as a as a non-Muslim is it's just I just find it really helpful to to have the framework of racism, which is something that you know I've I've, I've grown up understanding, um, and. Uh, because it brings it to the level of the individual um, and away from from ideas, um, which is is what free speech activists always seem to sort of complain about with with uh, terms like uh, Islamophobia and, and, and anti-Semitism that we the certain ideas that we might not be able to to discuss. 
Thank you very much, Robert. We've, we've got um, one of the uh, uh, academics who really has been inspirational to me, actually, and, and to many of the, the people who've been involved in, in, in looking at this definition, uh, Professor Salman Sayed, and I think hopefully Abdul Karim Gokil might be here, but I think so, uh, uh, Professor Salman Sayed, you, you, you've put your hand up. Would you like to ask a question or, or put a comment? Your, your insights are, are, are ones that we always look forward to. Salman, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, so. right, thank you. Yeah, um, just thank you very much um, for all this. And thank you for everyone who said all of these things about it. I just want to make it very clear that we're, what we're asking from a definition, and I think it's been laid out in all the um, presentations we made, is really about trying to um, have a public understanding of a phenomenon that many people get confused about so they can actually start thinking about it and reflecting on it and how they um, may be complicit in it. I think to ask the definition to resolve every single um, practice of discrimination or every single inequality is a little too much and it would not be something one would expect of any other definition. So I think we it's a kind of a red herring to talk about the definition. What we're really talking about is the public understanding. If, and I think the point that Robert made is really, really, abs after so many years of struggle, people have a rough understanding of Islamophobia. Everyone on this call can tell me what, uh, what racism is. Um, they may not have a legal definition of racism, but they have a general understanding of what racism is. And that allows us to say, well, Islamophobia isn't particularly special in that sense. It is just a type of racism. And what you think you wouldn't do things or what uh, behavior you wouldn't conduct because you think it's racist, you shouldn't do that when it applies to Muslims as well. So I think it's really, really important to understand that we already have, after hard struggle and hard work, some way of understanding racism. And all we're trying to say is that if we treat Islamophobia as a type of racism, it gets you one part into the door. And then the focus is on Muslimness. And I think, again, the examples have been given that it's not about how many, whether you say your prayers five times a day or what kind of Muslim you are. Most uh, Islamophobes can't actually tell whether someone's a Muslim or not a Muslim, never mind whether they're a good Muslim or a bad Muslim, whatever that may mean in whatever context. So I think it's really important that we understand what the purpose of defining Islamophobia is. It's not to do anything more than help people to point out if a practice or a set of behaviors, a set of um, conditions, which really, really undermine um, this country from being an equal society. That's what it's really about. It's about justice for many, many people. It starts off being a justice for Muslims, but it also justice for everyone else. Because you can't live in a just society if a large segment of that society are subject to injustice systematically in a sustained manner. Thank you so much, Professor Salman Sayed. Um, uh, Professor Sayed and, and Abdul Karim Vakil, who's also on this call, are, are, are two of the people who, who also wrote a forward for this report. Um, please do read it uh, in detail. It's uh, alongside the forward by uh, Baroness Warsi, uh, right to the beginning. And, and really, you know, th that, uh, both of these uh, academics have been working in this field of Islamophobia for, for decades. And it, it's upon their shoulders that any work is done. So thank you very much for your comments. It's, it's something that we really, really much appreciate. And, and uh, moving on exactly from what Professor Said says is really moving on to this next panel, where we're now going to move not just on the theoretical basis that, that we've talked about before, you know, the journey that, that, that has happened, which is what which Professor Warsi talked about, the, the, uh, the, the fact that Islamophobia is very important and, and has a real impact, which uh, Faduma talked about, or the free speech angle, which has been one of the criticisms that have been has been made. Now I'm really moving on to the implementation and the impact of Islamophobia and what we can do about it, because it's re a real challenge in society. Many of, many of you will be aware that how uh, a third of the population believe that Muslims are trying to take over the country. And when that type of view is there in the public space, whether it's you know um, statistics talking about how um, Islam is a threat to the British way of life, and therefore on the back of that, Muslims are taking over England, which is what even young children believe. 31% of young children between the ages of 10 and 14 think that Muslims are taking over England. When you have that kind of Islamophobic idea 
embedded in, in, in society. It's a real challenge. And now we see the impact of them. We're very fortunate to have uh, our second panel who will be starting to look at the at what we can do about it and, and, and some of the, the real challenges in the systematic uh, and institutional racism that Muslims face. Um, and to start this panel, we have uh, Rizwana Hamid, who's the director of the Muslim Council of Britain's Center for Media Monitoring. Rizwana uh, is, is well known to many of you who've been involved and engaged in, in some of the work of the Muslim Council of Britain in, in different spaces. She's, she's responsible for overseeing the Center for Media Monitoring's uh, work and engaging with key stakeholders. She has over 30 years experience working in the media. She's an award-winning filmmaker and has worked as a producer, director for uh, BBC Television television in the news current affairs documentary uh, section as well as for channel 4 and other international broadcasters she's run media skills workshops for disenfranchised communities here in the uk and across the globe including in zimbabwe and south africa it's a real pleasure to have Rizwana speak to us about islamophobia uh, in the media uh, and detailing some of the work from the from the center for media monitoring Rizwana. thank you uh, thank you assalamu alaikum to everybody and good evening to everybody um as McDad said, I'm not going to talk about the definition, but I'm going to talk about the work that we're doing in tackling Islamophobia within the media. Um, before I joined the Center for Media Monitoring, like McDad said, I worked in mainstream media for a long time. And I was really well aware of the misrepresentation, the prejudice and the bias against Muslims and Islam. But, and I tried to fight it internally, but it wasn't until I started working for the Center for Media Monitoring and monitoring the media daily that I really fully understood the extent to which the coverage was so Islamophobic. Um, and the difference between what I can now achieve with the CFMM team and what I could achieve challenging editors and colleagues individually is immeasurable and a real testament to McDowell himself who set up this project um, off the back of his own individual efforts of monitoring the media informally but now that we're set up as a project, I think within the three years that we've been in existence, we've created a real sound and extensive evidence base. We've engaged with all the main key stakeholders within the media, regulators, parliamentarians. Um, we've intervened on a policy level by making submissions to parliamentary inquiries, to consultations. Um, and I think we're, we're beginning to see a realization within the media that whether it's unconscious bias, whether it's prejudice, or whether there's an outright agenda um, in order to kind of, you know, portray Muslims and uh, Islam in a negative way, that this exists. So we're at the beginning of this journey. We've made a few inroads, but there's a long way to go. But I mean, by the end, I'll tell you how you can also get involved and help us do the work we're doing. I'd just like to give you a bit of background in terms of some of our findings before I actually go into the most common tropes and themes that come out in the media. So to date, we've actually analyzed um, close to 300,000 online print and broadcast, uh, print articles and broadcast clips. And so it's a really, really extensive evidence base that we have. And we've produced two groundbreaking reports looking at the state of the media reporting on Muslims and Islam, and also how the British media reports on terrorism. And we have another report coming out in April, which will be looking at the coverage from 2018 to 2020. So a very extensive period, three years, that we'll be looking at to actually assess what has gone on during this time. Um, some of the um, findings from our reports, for example, is that 59% of the articles that we analyzed over a quarter associated Muslims with negative behavior. Over a third generalized and uh, misrepresented Muslims. Um, and, in our, and the most reoccurring theme, and I don't think this will come as a surprise to anyone um, when reporting on Muslims, was terrorism. And in our report in terrorism, in which we um, compared 16 very kind of, you know, um, well-known attacks, you know, globally from America to Europe to the New Zealand attack, we found that the media is consistently inconsistent in the way that it reports on terrorism, depending on who the perpetrator is, whether they're a so-called Muslim or whether they're a white supremacist, neo-Nazi, or um, from the far right. And we can see this through terminology, for example, that the terms terror, terror, 
terrorism and terrorists appeared nine times more frequently alongside the words Muslim and Islam than they do when the perpetrator is a white supremacist and neo-Nazi. Um, the, the word terror, terrorism just isn't used that frequently. Um, the faith of a person is very quickly revealed within the media when they happen to have a name that sounds like a Muslim's name. Their faith is highlighted very quickly. Um, the, the words Allah Wakbar appear generally in, in headlines, you know, as clickbait and has become synonymous with, with terrorism and terrorist attacks. So with terrorism, we find a lot of, of problematic reporting, inconsistencies, and narratives that are built up, which, you know, when it comes to um, Muslim perpetrators, and if I give you an example, there was the Orlando club bombing in which approximately 50 people died. And immediately the, the perpetrator was uh, named as an uh, ISIS maniac. The links between him and ISIS were very tenuous and on further kind of um, investigation, the man had mental health problems, he had a criminal record, he had drug abuse problems, but those aspects of his identity were never really delved into. What was delved into was the fact that he was a Muslim and had these global links with ISIS, which he didn't. In contrast, when you came to the Christchurch killing, for example, someone who clearly had global links because you know his live stream video of the attack in Christchurch showed the links that he had with the far right and the, the kind of um, um, ammunition he got from Andres Breivik and from many other far right white supremacists. He was portrayed as an angelic angel who'd kind of fallen, you know, in the, on, onto the wrong path and be, had become a mass killer. So a, an attempt to kind of humanize him, but also to show that he wasn't always like this, whereas with Muslims, it's like this is inherently part and parcel of our identity. And that's one of the biggest tropes, um, which is, you know, Muslims and Islam are one, a threat to, to the West. And, you know, I think other speakers have kind of dealt with that. But we find within the coverage, there's um, a kind of a, a throwback to, to referring to the great replacement theory which is a conspiracy theory by white supremacists that is Muslims and Islam are taking over the West. And we find a lot of far right tropes within, you know, right leaning um, media, but also religious publications um, talking about the so-called Islamization of Europe. We had one report in, um, the Christ in Christian Today where there was a bishop discussing an Islamic invasion and claiming that, you know, Europe is being Islamized. And this falls with, you know, the whole theory of, and this is reported widely in, in the media, you know, that Muslims want to impose Sharia law and replace, you know, the current law in Britain with, you know, laws that govern all uh, citizens of Britain. Um, we've got misleading um, tropes which are perpetuated by, you know, the likes of, and I'll name them because I think people you know, their work um, is testimony to what they say uh, about Muslims and Islam, but the likes of Rod Little, Melanie Phillips, Charles Moore, Douglas Murray, you know, you know, the list is endless. But I think one of the people, Melanie Phillips and Rod Little have been very kind of um, vocal on presenting Muslims as one being anti-Semitic, or two, as not being able to be trusted because, you know, and there's a new concept that um, Melanie Phillips has been kind of promoting, which is the concept of taqiyya, which is, you know, it was um, derived historically, it emerged as an attempt to protect religious communities from persecution and allowed Muslims and adherents to conceal their faith um, in order to protect their own lives. Now, she's kind of um, portrayed this as, you know, Muslims are all deceptive and so they shouldn't be trusted, whereas this kind of concept of taqiyya exists in English law, you know, the principle of necessity, it exists in Judaism, which is pikuach uh, nefash, which is again protecting human life under necessity of life being threatened. Um, the othering of Muslims was seen very clearly during the COVID um, pandemic, and very early on, I mean, when we initially 
heard of the pandemic, we thought, phew, hopefully there's going to be less, you know, about Muslims and Islam, and this is a, you know, a national and global phenomenon that's affecting us all. But very quickly, we started seeing Muslims being singled out. A lot of imagery, imagery was particularly problematic. Lots of imagery when, you know, the articles or the broadcast clip uh, programs were specifically to do with COVID in generally, uh, COVID affecting people generally, we had of women in hijabs or, or mosques and a, a kind of a plethora of imagery um, around Muslims and Islam, which was very disproportionate to the kind of imagery we generally see on issues that um, relate to all British citizens. We never see Muslims in, in the amount uh, you know, of imagery that we've seen during this COVID pandemic. We don't have the statistics, but we can clearly see a trend there. And there's been lots of misleading you know, imagery whereby they're discussing um, a COVID in a prison in California, yet they're showing a mosque. You know, another one was of um, schools in Europe being shut down, and the image was of Muslim men in hazmat uh, suits praying. Uh, so really, really bizarre um, um, imagery. Lots and lots of other kind of problematic um, coverage in terms of headlines. You know, we all know of the Telegraph's exclusive that half of imported COVID cases were coming from Pakistan when you dug a bit deeper, we complained about it and we won a complaint at the at IPSO, the, the news regulator. But you found that it was a completely inaccurate and misleading headline. It wasn't half of all um, um, imported cases. There were 30 cases. They were looking at a fixed period of June and it represented less than 0.01% of the imported cases. M the, the majority were imported from Europe, but that article didn't you know, delve on that at all. Um, stories of you know, mass graves, the, the fears of a spike in COVID due to uh, Ramadan, kind of misquoting a doctor who had kind of hypothetically said that yes, if Muslims, you know, went to the mosque during Ramadan, there could be a spike. It was actually reported as fears of spike during Ramadan. Um, the other kind of very, and again, our terrorist report touched on this, but this kind of trope of Muslims having a unique penchant for violence and that Islam encourages violence and therefore we are all inherently violent. And you know, this is often reinforced in the, in the media, primarily because of the context within Muslims are reported um, is, is that of violence and terrorism. Um, other, another one is that you know, Islam is particularly barbaric and intolerant of other religions. And as I've said, inherently anti-Semitic. Um, and that's a running narrative in, in the media, um, you know, the belief that so-called Muslim culture, and again, this homogenous Muslim culture, is uncivilized, barbaric, and less advanced um, than the West. Um, again, I'm sorry to be quoting Melanie Phillips here, but, you know, she, in the time she wrote that both secular and Muslim zealots are displaying intolerance from opposite viewpoints, destroying authentic Western culture. So there's, again, this this kind of theory that, you know, Muslims are barbaric, they're kind of coming into this country, taking over, and, you know, Western culture is under threat and in jeopardy. Um, another kind of um, trope, and Rod Little, I'll quote this time, is when he, um, you know, kind of states that Muslims are anti-Semitic and Islamic scriptures um, validate such anti-Semitism. And he said, we know why, the Muslims are anti-Jewish. It's all there in Muhammad's hadith and in the Quran. No evidence to substantiate this claim, but you know, blanket statements. And we find this constantly: generalizations, blanket statements, you know, no evidence, um, very kind of weak sources when it comes to, to Muslims and Islam, um, when it comes to terrorism attacks, very kind of very kind of um. Uh, the tendency to very quickly go with witness statements as long as they kind of um, substantiate and support the view that, oh gosh, this is a Muslim, another attack, you know, and the kind of fear mongering that's there. 
Um, another trope again, and we get this, you know, we've seen it in programs like the Bodyguard, as well as, you know, lots of other reporting around Muslim women, and that's, you know, that women are oppressed, that Muslim men are kind of uh, are misogynistic, that Islam, you know, um, um, curtails women's human rights. And I know I've probably gone way over, there's just so much. So I'll get on to what can be done. I mean, I've explained to you what CFMM is doing in terms of monitoring the media, doing the advocacy work whereby we engage constructively with all the key stakeholders, media, you know, senior decision makers within, within the media, we hold round tables, we submit um, uh, evidence to inquiries, but we also train and empower Muslim communities to proactively engage with the media, hold them to account, and also enter the profession of journalism or working within the media. So we have training that we offer, and we have one specific um, workshop that's coming up next Wednesday, and I think Tabitha is going to put the link on the chat, but it's a, a, a workshop on Islamophobia in the media, and it kind of looks generally at the tropes and the problematic reporting, as well as some of the evidence base, but it also teaches you how to monitor the media yourself, because we need more people to be doing this. It can't just be left to a small team, you know, to do all of this. We need to take ownership of this, and we need lots and lots of other people doing this job in their local vicinities, taking on their local media, the national media. And we teach people how to, you know, monitor, recognize what the, what the problems are, what regulations are being breached, when you should contact newspapers directly, when you should escalate it to the regulators, if so on Ofcom. Um, and so I hope that you will register for that workshop next week. And I'm sorry I've taken up so much time. There's just so much that can be said on the media. And that's an area that we hope, you know, if anybody wants to kind of volunteer for us, become part of our volunteer base, please do get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rizwana. Thank you for your work in this really important space. You know, the way that there is, uh, Muslims are reported on Islam, uh, Muslims and Islam are reported on in the media is, is an important part of the discussions on Islamophobia. And, and it's really important to, to, to hear you um, uh, showcase a lot of the work that, that you're doing, um, that we're all doing it in, in the Center for Media Monitoring. So thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Zain Sardar. Uh, Zain, he manages the fund, uh, Aziz Foundation's Preferred Partner Scheme. And he, as, as well as completing a PhD in Birkbeck, um, in, he also has acted as an auditor on behalf of the uh, QAA and the University of Kent. Um, and he's going to be, he's uh, received an honorary lifetime membership of Kent Union in, in recognition of um, his achievements in this field of student democracy and governance. Um, he's going to be talking about the work of the Aziz Foundation and how they're tackling and addressing Islamophobia in universities, an important part of the overall work on Islamophobia. Thank you very much, uh, Mikdal, for that wonderful <clears throat> introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank the MCB. It's wonderful um, speaking from an MCB um, platform. And I'd like to say as well that um, the, the previous speakers were truly inspirational um, in the way that they're going about tackling Islamophobia. So my contribution in the next five minutes will provide an overview of the work that we are undertaking to tackle institutional Islamophobia in the higher education context. And I shall pass over to Miriam to give the Aziz scholars perspective. Broadly speaking, now is an important time to have this discussion, particularly in light of the UUK report on racial harassment, which was published back in November. It gave a wake up call to the higher education sector, focusing on the practical steps that can be taken to defeat institutional racism and build communities of cohesion on university campuses. We'd also do well to notice that the Education Secretary has called on universities to adopt the IHRA definition of anti Semitism or risk having their funding cut by the OFS. Within these circumstances, it is right that we continue to push to advance the operationalization of the APPG definition of Islamophobia. In terms of the Aziz Foundation's work, combating Islamophobia is core to our mission. And indeed, through our preferred partner scheme established last year, this has enabled us 
to center our work on deinstitutionalizing Islamophobia through instigating reform across the sector. In doing this, we can curb the enabling conditions that allow for overt hostility and abuse targeting British Muslim students to, to surface and which furthermore limits the professional and academic opportunities available to our communities. To this end, prospective partners must fulfill conditions for admittance to our scheme, including provision of tailored cultural and, and social support for British Muslim students, closing the BME attainment gap and adopting the APBG definition of Islamophobia. In relation to this last condition, we have extended it into a general campaign to encourage as many institutions to adopt the definition as possible. Notable successes to date include Imperial College London and Aston University, both of whom have incorporated it within their quality and diversity policies, as well as London Metropolitan University, one of the first to do so in the sector. De Montfort and Durham University have done so separately, which is an added cause for celebration. If we now turn to the case study of London Metropolitan University, the institution's Centre for Inclusion and Equity, led by Dr Zainab Khan, was instrumental in making the case for adoption with our support. The definition was duly adopted in November, and crucially, off the back of this, the acclaimed race equality activist, Sophia Khan, produced a report on Islamophobia within the higher education sector. The report goes beyond the formality of adoption to explore ways the definition can be implemented. This is a report that the Aziz Foundation fed into, and it represents a blueprint that can be replicated by other institutions across the sector in the fight to root out institutionalized Islamophobia. Some of the significant attributes of this report include that it analyzes data at the granular institutional level, the lived experiences, concerns, and needs of British Muslim students on the micro scale. Building, building on this, we can also explore the differential experience of Muslim students across the disciplines. This is a key addition to the recent literature centered around the sector wide scale, such as Alison Scott Bauman's recent report and the work done by the NUS in 2018. The report deploys a critical methodology one that foregrounds the intersectionality between faith and ethnicity. And as we know, since the British Muslim identity is intersectional, Islamophobia targets this identity by assailing it at different points as a form of intersectional prejudice. The report is comprehensive in looking at the British Muslim student experience, the institutional degree awarding gap, curriculum content, faith provision, and recruitment of academic staff. It is worth noting that while some universities may provide adequate faith provision, they may fall below standards in other areas. Hence, the holistic picture is vital here. In order to fully exploit the momentum created by this report, our task is now to facilitate an audit around the lived experience of British Muslim students at institutions across the country, commencing with our partners. This will provide widening participation and EDI practitioners, as well as academic staff with research interests in this area, with the data they need to make the case to their senior leadership that an institutional overhaul is required to eradicate Islamophobia, particularly in its more subtle manifestations. The strategy is to get a dozen institutions conducting these audits in order to trigger a sort of transformative multiplier effect across the sector. This data collection will inform interventions, awareness training and support schemes, including in the sphere of access and participation that will help in operationalizing the definition and in truly creating a inclusive learning environment for British Muslim students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Zain Sardar for your important role work. Now we're very fortunate to have Mariam Daras, who's also an Aziz Foundation scholar, and she's pursuing a master's in global politics at the LSE. Her, her research focuses on the precursors to ethnic violence against Muslim communities. And in, in addition to her master's program, she's involved in a research project with LSE's Department for Media and Communications on the depiction of Muslim migrants within British media. 
Um, Mar Mariam is going to be talking about her entry into academia and the research for projects she's involved in uh, and, and touch on the ways she's become aware of how these essentialist narratives towards Muslims manifest in academia and how they can be challenged. Another important manifestation of Islamophobia in the real space, in the real world. Mariam. Thank you for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be speaking at an event of such centrality, not only to the Muslim community, but to the wider British public. Um, so thanks to the Aziz Foundation, I'm pursuing my master's in global politics at the LSE, having just completed my undergraduate degree also at the LSE. My journey into academia stems in part from an Islamophobic incident I experienced in 2016, when my siblings and I were removed from a plane whilst traveling. Writing for and speaking with various media outlets at the time highlighted the importance of Muslims voicing their own experiences with intolerance and contributing to public discourse. Higher education then became a goal for me. I thought that in order to tackle intolerance, we have to first seek to understand the forms that it takes and the political systems from which it's born. So during my undergraduate degree, I encountered what I saw as Orientalist depictions of Islam within academia. Constantly challenging these with my professors made me aware of the need for more Muslims to make their mark within political science and to pursue academia at the postgraduate level to make that possible. Academia influences social change in so many ways. Um, at the MISO level, it provides an avenue for ideas to be shared and disseminated. Um, but then on a wider scale, it also has the capacity to shape the ways in which religious, religious groups are presented in public discourse. It's vital for Muslims to be involved in these processes uh, in ensuring that essentialist narratives about our community are continually challenged and deconstructed. So I'm currently involved in two research projects. The first is a component of my degree and um, it's on the precursors to mass violence against Muslim communities in various global contexts. I look at the ways in which Muslims are presented with this sort of in and out group framing, uh, the dissemination of hate speech, systemic persecution, where this is all leading and what it's setting a precedent for in terms of nationhood and belonging. In a globalizing world where ideas of the nationalist imagination are becoming more salient, exclusionary rhetoric directed towards the Muslim community makes us vulnerable. Rather than taking a retroactive stance, I wanted to pursue an active line of research that looks at the warning signs of violence against Muslims as the minority. Alongside my master's, I am also involved in a research project with LSE Media and Communications uh, on media and migration. So my research uses discourse analysis to focus on the depiction of Muslim migrants from the Middle East in British newspapers. I look at how the media acts as a channel through which divisive rhetoric within academia enters everyday public discourse. My findings highlight racialized depictions of the refugee crisis in the media, um, including the treatment of Muslim migrants as a security threat. My article also highlights the points of connection that need to be made between traditional discourse and political science and then contemporary policies and media analysis. As well as formal research, navigating academia as a Muslim means continually interrogating the narratives that portray Muslim communities. Um, my own experience with the need for systemic change at the postgraduate level is related to a topic that I covered last term entitled Globalized Islam and Global Jihad. The fact that globalized Islam was conflated with jihad and um, the ways in which this topic had been included seemingly randomly in an unrelated module, this to me was a prime example of the reductive way that Islam is often treated in academia. This kind of presentation is also harmful. Terms within Islamic lexicon are commonly misused in the media and the wider social sphere, which contributes to societal Islamophobia. By academic institutions also wrongly adopting terms like jihad, they risk legitimizing this misappropriation. So representation within academia in terms of widening the curriculum is spoken about so often and is so important, but what's of equal importance is the kind of representation we should be getting. This isn't just representation in and of itself, but a representation that provides the treatment of Islam in academia with greater respect and dignity. When we think about safety on campus as Muslims, it's something that isn't only expected in the midst of other students, but also with regards to the education system in itself. Um, and in knowing that topics related to our community receive nuance and a fair analysis. Dehumanization is a key step towards harm and violence against Muslims and by ensuring a dignified portrayal of the Muslim community, at least within academia, Islamophobia at the systemic level is able to be challenged. 
So far in my classes, I've confronted issues relating to Orientalism, colonialism and gender based development. Um, and I've been able to defend and highlight the position of the Muslim community, particularly Muslim women within these spheres. Had it not been for the Aziz Foundation, I wouldn't have had the chance to attend, present in or facilitate those classes and to draw attention to how dangerous narratives within politics and within development affect Muslim communities. When our identity is weaponized, as it so often is, it's crucial for Muslims to be at the forefront of academic discourse in facilitating dialogue and in enhancing the position of our community. It's this that I'd also want to encourage other young Muslims to be involved in um, in critically evaluating public narratives and seeing academia as a means to develop them in a way that ensures fairness, equity and respect across all communities. So I'd really like to thank the Aziz Foundation for making my experience within higher education possible. And of course, the MCB for its commitment to challenging Islamophobia in its many insidious forms. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mariam. Uh, and you know the, the experience you went through uh, in the air, uh, in the airport is is, is one that I, I I always remember, and I I, I think it you know it typi it typifies a lot of what many Muslims sometimes feel that they're they're, they're going to face. And your experience was one of the worst I've seen. And you know it's uh, a testament to your courage and character that, that, that you've taken that and and grown stronger and stronger on the back of it. So thank you so much for for that. Um, we're now very fortunate to, to have our final panelist, who's Aisha Chowdhury. Uh, she's the head of diversity and inclusion at NHS England. Um, um, she's a proud mother, a Scottish Asian Muslim and passionate about inclusive leadership. She's worked in the, in the NHS for seven years in the English health economy for over four and a half years, and is currently the head of equality of diversity and inclusion in the HROD or the People Directorate of NHS England. Her role is about enabling a culture of inclusion where you build accountability into your practices and encourage a workplace environment where everyone feels they have a voice and belong. Um, and uh, she she's just graduated from the Nye Bevan Executive Leadership Programme through the NHS Leadership Academy in February. And she's going to be speaking about creating a faith-friendly workplace and how you can discuss faith in the workplace and promote greater diversity and inclusion. An important part of our overall understanding of making sure Islamophobia really is uh, understood and tackled in the, in the real world. Aisha. Thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Great to be here. Um, thank you to all the speakers that have gone before me. Um, you know, it, it's been a, a really good, interesting and useful um, talk so far. Um, I'm not going to spend too long. I'm just conscious that we are at the, the end of today's session. Um, but let's see where this discussion takes us. Hopefully this is the start of many more of these types of conversations because I think there's there's so much value in, um, in touching on this. So um, in the NHS we have over 1.3 million people in service. This includes a range of roles from frontline clinical roles through to various business functional roles. Um, we know that approximately 5.9% of the English population is Muslim and about 3.3% of the NHS workforce is Muslim. So a bit of an underrepresentation when we look at um, the, 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 the whole work, the, the whole Muslim population. Um, and, you know, and the, the point made earlier on about where Muslims, it's felt that Muslims are taking over. We certainly don't see that in um, the, the representation of our uh, Muslim workforce. Um, it's worth noting that NHS England and NHS Improvement is the lead organisation for the NHS. Uh, this is where I work and I'm well placed to talk through my work on inclusion for our Muslim workforce. Um, so we have about a population of about 9,000 people in service and, um, and we have a representation of about 3.5% who are of Muslim faith. When we look at the NHS, historically, we've had the NHS constitution. Now that's built on principles of social justice. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and it sets out that the NHS is a, a service that provides universal health care for everyone and that we have also our NHS values, which include everyone counts and respect and dignity for all. So that given what's different now and why would any changes or improvements stick now more than ever before? 
Um, we've seen a global awakening of the social injustices experienced not just by black people on the back of uh, the death of George Floyd and Black Lives Movement, um, Black Lives Matter movement, but COVID's impacted everyone in some way and in particular the equalities groups more than, um, more than, than others. So for the first time um, for us in the NHS, we've got the world's largest workforce strategy with a recently launched people plan. Central to our people plan is equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, and 25% of that people plan is focused on creating a sense of belonging. That's where our people feel they've got a voice, that they're heard and that psychological safety um, is built into to everything that, that we do and um, that people have the psychological safety to speak out about the important issues. Um, yeah. So over the last year, our work on addressing inequalities has totally been accelerated. Um, we've taken a number of steps to address the stru structural inequalities that exist within our organisation. Now, I'm not going to talk through all of the things that, that we've done as an organisation, but um, what, what's been really pertinent and what's really propelled our, our work on addressing inequalities has been two big things. Um, one of the, the, the first big things is gaining senior level um, commitment. So that's every national and regional director in the NHS has signed up to, um, and, and made a, a commitment and a pledge to address inequalities in their region and their directorate. And they have a plan in place that, um, that sets out their actions, what they're gonna do to address those inequalities. We've wrapped that around with um, governance and accountability. So all these plans um, are reported back to our board. That's the, the, the whole of the NHS board um, and reporting back on progress. So what actions are being taken and delivered against. Um, so that's two big things that we've done over the last year. Um, what I really wanna talk about is one of the biggest challenges that we've got just now. So um, whilst our colleagues share their experiences, whether at point of care or whether they're in an office setting, their experiences of negative behavior, which happens almost on a day-to-day -day occurrence, that's not reflected through our ER cases. So that shows us that our Muslim colleagues are not speaking about speaking up about the experiences and they're certainly not raising them as real issues that are affecting them. So this in turn tells me that we've still got a lot, a lot of work to do um, and that's centred around building the trust of our Muslim colleagues and ensuring that the handling of those sensitive issues and experiences that they're having, that that doesn't turn into um, it being a negative, having a negative impact on them. So we've got ongoing engagement sessions and um, with our Muslim communities. And um, through those engagement sessions, we know that our Muslim colleagues experience those negative behaviors and they can be best described as microaggressions, um, which can be said as, as you know, comments on appearances, gestures of exclusion based on assumptions and what's delivered in a light-hearted manner but lands in a way that's inconsiderate or hurtful um, and it's the accumulation of um, the effect of those microaggressions that can have a detrimental health impact resulting in exclusion and um, not being valued or recognized or not being valued or recognized equally or even worse having terrible mental health impacts uh, and there's a lot of research that's out there. Professor David Williams uh, from Harvard University evidence the, the, the negative health impacts on microaggressions. Um, so that's that's kind of like outlining the 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 main concern really that we have around um, and the impacts for our, our Muslim workforce. Um, there's a power of work that's being done with our staff network, our Muslim staff network. Um, and that 
it, it, I mean, that work is really there to amplify the voices of our Muslim colleagues at all levels. The Muslim network also creates a space for um, some of the complex and difficult conversations that need to take place. And they also enable um, our colleagues to speak truth to power so that we can build a stronger voice for change across our organisation. Um, that said, some of the issues that have been raised um, includes career progression for our Muslim colleagues, faith literacy amongst colleagues to increase awareness and understanding about the Islamic faith in order to create an environment that's more supportive and inclusive of Muslim colleagues, um, and also essentially building that sense of a sense of belonging for, mis for Muslim staff. Um, we know that just under a third of our staff either don't disclose their religious belief or have left this completely blank and, and don't complete it at all. Um, and we also know that our Muslim staff that are um, across some of our offices, um, you know, anecdotal feedback tells us that they're significantly underrepresented in their workplace. Um, and that can then also lead to experiences um, feeling it lead to experiences of feeling isolated and um, not having enough support in place. So importantly, some of the support offers that we've put in place um, for our Muslim colleagues is to, um, and again, this work is, is all coming through our Muslim network, um, is a career development workshops for our Muslim colleagues. Um, they've also been running specific events um, covering topics such as Islamophobia in the NHS um, and enabling the sharing of stories about the experience of Muslims um, and running a series of staff profiles, blogs um, across our media channels. Um, and that was during Islamic Islamophobia Awareness Month. Um, they've also published prayer time guidance for managers and teams and that's to enable flexibility and reasonable adjustments to support Muslim colleagues to observe religious obligations and, and also feel comfortable in the workplace. Um, the COVID vaccine webinars have been stood up and um, delivered across our organisation and that's been enabling questions about clinical and Islamic perspectives on the rollout of the vaccine. Um, we've also had um, uh, a mental health offer, which we'll be launching soon, um, and that includes a counselling offer and resources that incorporate Islamic teachings. Um, and lastly, there, last year we published a Ramadan guidance, which has currently been updated um, for the up upcoming religious period in light of um, the updated COVID-19 context and the continued rollout of the vaccination programme. So that's an overview of some of the things that, that we've been putting in place to support our Muslim colleagues. Um, and just final point that I really wanna to touch on is um, that there's a real power in allyship. So this is about being the support for Muslim colleagues, not just when there's a problem, but also recognizing and supporting Muslim colleagues, making the time to really understand what's important to them, um, getting to know colleagues on a personal basis, being curious in a kind and considered way. Um, and looking ahead, I think it's really important that everyone takes responsibility for what they think, what they feel, what they believe, question what they feel in that way, and importantly, speak out and act when that injustice is right in front of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aisha, for your for your uh, contribution today. I mean, it's 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 a real pleasure to have you here, and given the work that you do at the at NHS um, England at the head of the diversity and inclusion part, that that's really part and parcel of what we want when when it comes to looking at Islamophobia. You know, um, ensuring that Muslims feel equal within the workplace, and and your work in this space is 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 very much appreciated by by all of us. So thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, we have some time for Q and A. If there are any questions that that, that anyone has. Um, uh, obviously, people are are are, are slowly uh, are leaving because it is quite late this this evening. Um, but let me just check if there are any new questions that people want to ask um, for any of them. Um, firstly, Zane, are you still there on the? Um... Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Zane, um, uh, can you um, 
point people to the report that you were talking about on 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 about universities? Um, yeah, so the report is really it's a landmark report, the London Met report, and the reason is um, it actually crunches the institutional level data um, on uh, Islamophobia within the university. Um, it is available online. Um, if you go to the London Met um, Centre for Equity uh, for Equity and Inclusion, it's there for everyone to see. So it's there for public consumption. But I would recommend that um, everyone reads that because that's really a, a model for the entire sector. And we hope that other institutions will conduct similar research because the wide ranging institutional reform that we require to eradicate Islamophobia in every single university will only happen if there's data and evidence which points to the impactful interventions that can do the job effectively. Thank you very much. Um, Aisha, one question that's come in uh, with regards to Muslims in the NHS, actually. Um, uh, Many people have seen how a lot of Muslims seem to have died uh, in terms of because of COVID in the early part of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. That seems to be from all the pictures that came up. Is there much work that's being done to look at disproportionate impact of COVID on Muslims, in particular within the NHS, working to keep us all safe? So, Aisha, I can you, am I, am I off mute? No, you're off mute, yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so the, we, we don't leave that area of work, you know, in terms of looking at the, the, the negative impacts on the deaths. Um, I think that work's being led um, independently. I, I can't remember the name of the body that are leading that work, um, but certainly for, you know, the measures that we've taken and, and what we've put in place to protect our people, um, and particularly the, um, the you know, the, the impact on our BAME people and then our, our Muslim colleagues um, within, um, within that category as well. We implemented a um, really strong and robust process about ensuring that, um, everyone's risk assessed and um, you know in the in the initial phase the, the risk assessments weren't in place unfortunately um, but then we um, you know when the, the four main groups that were um, identified as vulnerable and, and high risk um, and our beam category was as one of them and um, we implemented the risk assessment um, and made sure that every Every, every BAME person had a risk assessment and that would identify then if they were at high risk and um, what the steps they needed to be taken to, um, to you know, reduce that risk as much as possible, as well as providing all the proper equipment um, in terms of the PPE equipment for them as well. Thank you very much. Um, Mariam, I'm not sure if you're still there, but there's a question that's come for you and I think this will have to be the last question. Um, Either? Yes, Perfect. I am. Perfect. Now, great to have you still on the panel. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your experience of Islamophobia at the airport? Is that something that you have faced since then? Have some of your other have other parts of your family faced that? And how do you see that as part of the overall Islamophobia in society? Um, it hasn't luckily been something I've experienced since then on such an overt scale. Um, but uh, it's kind of, it makes you aware of, of the ways that it can manifest. And I mean, as I was mentioning in, in my brief talk, um, it's made me kind of conscious of the ways in which Muslims are treated as the other sort of. So at the airport that day, I mean, um, the report is still in the garden if anyone's interested about my experience. It feels like so long ago now. Um, but um, that was kind of this, I mean, whoever accused us of being terrorists that day sort of got away with it. And it was, you know, they kind of got away with it with impunity. And it felt like this, um, this idea of sort of almost being a second class citizen. Um, and what I've learned from that is to have the courage to sort of speak up more about those sorts of incidents and to prevent that from happening again in whichever scale I can. And 
Um, I chose academia as their route, as I mentioned, because I think that um, concepts and themes that we explore within academia with relation to Muslim as the other or with relation to ethnic minorities can really translate into the sort of discourse we see on the societal level, what people think is acceptable um, and the ways in which people treat each other. Thank you very much. And thank you for the, this whole panel for, for joining us. Um, we, we are running a bit late. We have finished. Um, uh, we, we do have to finish. But but just a, a couple of final points, you know, um, thank you to this panel who, 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 who are really fantastic. Thank you to the first panel. But but also, you know, this report expands on how Islamophobia has been defined by the APPG. And, and, and what this report does is it sets out um, a, a very clear framework and reference that helps determine what does constitute Islamophobia and what doesn't constitute Islamophobia. And, it, and what we try and do in this report is address the key concerns and objections that have been leveled against uh, the definition of Islamophobia. Some of that is in bad faith, but some of it is in good faith and they're just different views. And what we try and do is address some of those within this report. Um, and and we want to look at how we can operationalize this, this, this definition, which has got such broad support within Muslim communities, within almost all political parties, other than the Conservative Party within, within England and Wales, but support within the Conservative Party in Scotland. Um, within academia, basically most, if not all, of the, the biggest academics in this field of Islamophobia seem to buy into and support this, this definition. And we want to make sure that, that we can see how Islamophobia uh, within is understood and therefore uh, can be tackled within society. So our real gratitude is to all of the expert contributors in the report, um, uh, whether it's Baroness Said who, who who wrote the first forward, Professor Salman uh, Said and Abdul Karim Vakil, who, who wrote the, the, the second forward, uh, Dr. Aaron Winter, Dr. Aurelian Monden, Rizwana Hamid, who, who spoke today, as did Robert Sharp, who, who also contributed to the report, Professor Nasser Mir, Dr. Mariam Mohammed, uh, Dr. Mariam Mahmoud, um, Khadija Ashayal, and Chris Molsom, um, who's a barrister, and we'll talk about the legal issues with regards to Islamophobia. So thank you so much to all of the experts who've, who've contributed. Thank you to all the panelists today who, who've played such an important role in, in showcasing what Islamophobia is, um, what the definition talks about, what it doesn't talk about, and, and more, most importantly, how to tackle it in the real world. So thank you all for, for joining, and, and we look forward to please participating in, in, in this important discussion of Islamophobia. The report itself will be out uh, within the next hour on social media. Please follow it, um, uh, support it, share it. And this is what the report looks like, a sneak preview of it before it comes out formally. So if, um, uh, please do uh, look at the report, engage with it, talk about it. And, 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 and through that, we're all going to be able to be much better informed about this really important phenomenon that faces Muslims uh, across the country. So thank you all so much for today. And um, uh, as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.